Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hey, Anders, good to see you. Hey, Philip. It's snowing here. It's really nice. So what are we talking about today? Yeah, today we talk with Noah Sherak about the history of the RevOps role how to get into it as a graduate or as someone who's looking to make a lateral career change, as well as the skills that you need to be successful. And then also the different types of company stages that can really help you speed up your career trajectory. And then finally, last but not least, we then dive into some best practices and how to find the ideal candidate and also how to make sure that the person that you hired is really set up for success. So I think it's a great episode and it's definitely worth listening to. Super excited to have you. Welcome, Noah. Well, let, let's dive right in. I mean, you know, I know you're kind of a history guy. And, uh, and so, you know, like in your, in your view, you know, how has RevOps developed? I mean, you probably all read that it's been the fast growing job in the US. Um, it's, you know, it's super high, but obviously it's been there for a while. So yeah, what's your view on the history of RevOps? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's definitely evolved over the years. I can say that to start with. Um, basically, like RevOps, as you guys probably know, like it's a relatively new term. Um, it's kind of the combination of marketing and sales at the end of the day. But it didn't start there. Really, like the the origins of it actually uh, are go back all the way to IBM, where it was called business operations. It was much more finance focused and you know sales driven. And this is even before like the concept of like a SaaS, you know, cloud based software, where like everything was on prem. You know, things were built into server rooms at the end of the day. And that's kind of like the origin of like where this role came from. It then kind of evolved. And then there was this focus on sales. So then it turned into sales operations. And, you know, that's when, you know, kind of Salesforce came onto the scene and more traditional CRMs took place. And really the focus was narrowed. So it's not so much on like the business operations and the finance side of things, but now, you know, sales is becoming at the front. And here we are today uh, with revenue operations. I think that the change took place around 2016, 2017, I remember being at a sales loft adjacent conference to Dreamforce back then, and they were like announcing it. This is the age of revenue operations, you know? And it's really now that all of these teams, you know, sales, marketing, customer success, and sometimes finance and other roles are now being combined into this one kind of larger operational department at the end of the day. And what's next? I think it's probably growth operation. Really like driving revenue from a revenue operation standpoint is going to be the next frontier where we're not actually just optimizing, but we're actually like contributing to revenue at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. I mean, uh, I had to smile when you said basically software as a service not being a thing, you know, always funny to hear and think back uh, to the old good old days. But um, I mean, you know, thinking about, um, you know, rough ops, I mean, it's a, it's a very hyped thing right now, right? Um, and, and rightly so, I think, uh, it's, it's, it's so important to, to be more successful in, you know, as a revenue team overall. But I think the question, you know, I, I sometimes ask myself, like, how do you get into it? Right. If you're studying or thinking about, you know, switching into this, how do you think, you know, like, what's your view on that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of new college graduates that are coming into this and seeing revenue operations as, you know, a different career trajectory than other conventional jobs. And really like non-tech jobs in tech have always had like a pretty high barrier to entry. And so thinking about, you know, how to actually like push people into this has been like at the forefront of my thoughts for quite a while. Um, most of the candidates I do see, unfortunately, in revenue operations have like a year or two of experience under their belt. The strongest candidates I see have either been SDRs or, you know, junior customer success managers or sales engineers. Sometimes they even come from marketing operations or product. Um, the strongest candidates I see that are entering with experience are also Salesforce admin at the end of the day. So people that have like hands on with CRM, like, and you don't necessarily even need to go to school for that. But things like that are generally like the best, you know, approach into this career. And and why do you think that? It's it's mostly because you're familiar with sales processes. Like if you if you graduate from college, like maybe you had a couple of courses in finance or operations, but really the strongest candidates I see might not even have a finance background. Maybe they came from the liberal arts or, you know, some other conventional background. But I do see that the strongest candidates know what a sales process is and know how to actually work with it and work within it at the end of the day. 
Mm. Don't, don't you see the risk that you're too technical and you might not understand the world of the AEs or SDRs day to day? So if you if you don't if you don't have that experience, you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you if you come yeah. purely from a from a admin perspective, right? Like, would you would you think that's a that's a risk? Or I mean, how that's do you understand what who you're risk. building for, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I really look for. I look for people that understand stories. So like storytelling is a really big of revenue in re revenue operations. I really see it as basically, you know, you have to, if you are an admin, of course, at the end of the day, you know how the systems work, but you should also be able to explain how the users actually use the system at the end of the day. I mean, I, based on that, I, I would wonder, is revenue operations really an entry-level role at all? Like, uh, should people really, like after studies, even go into revenue operations? Or wasn't, wouldn't that like be better to actually do a couple of other things first and then gradually move into that. Like I think starting out in marketing, much clearer, like you, you work on like a much, much, much smaller topic, much smaller area expertise that you need to learn and get into. And then from there, you can sort of like graduate into revenue operations. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really great point. And generally that is the case where it's, it's wonderful to see people with a little bit of job experience entering revenue operations because they have, as we said, this understanding of like how B2B SaaSs or just tech companies in general work. Um, we're very narrow focused. There's revenue operations across those like different companies, but folks in there. Um, there are, however, sometimes outstanding candidates from college. Like normally, you know, they are creative thinkers at the end of the day. They have very good project management skills and they probably have at least like a Salesforce certification or multiple UpSpot certifications and spreadsheet skills. Those are kind of like the The big things that I look for, like you have to be able to understand and work with data. And like we talked about earlier, storytelling. Sounds like product management to me. Yeah. So yeah. I think at the end, yeah. it's, it's, and it absolutely is. I think the best revenue operations candidates are like going to be agile project managers, right? And some of the strongest people I've worked with, like take a full, you know, sprint planning, all of like the, you know, software development frameworks and put them into revenue ops. And it's perfect. It works out so well at the end. It's just, you know, your product and your code are a little bit different. Yeah, I think I think we spoke a lot about like uh, discovery and how do you do discovery well and then also road mapping and project management, right? Um, I mean, if you if you think about somebody who's one or two years experience in either marketing, sales or CS, would you think then they should go rather into a mark ops, sales ops, CS ops role and then, you know, learn that and you know, have different experience of what would be the progression uh, from your point of view? Yeah. For entry level people, it's always better, or sorry, for people that have like one or two years experience, it's always better to kind of like go into what you know, right? And usually that's the easiest thing too, right? If you are a CSM or you are a marketing person to then take over the ops of your company and be responsible for that, it's going to be a far easier entry into this world of RevOps than just jumping straight in and like owning an entire org and owning sales processes when you know marketing. And I mean, if, if you're in marketing today or if you're an SDR or AE, like what can you do to, to learn the traits of, 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 you know, operations? Yeah, for sure. Um, really, it did, I, first things first is understanding CRMs. At the, like, you know, this is, this is the core thing that we do in RevOps is understand and work with and develop CRMs to the best of our abilities. Then looking at kind of the stories being told by the revenue team. What is the customer journey of your company look? Does it make sense at the end of the day? And then is it mapped into the CRM? That's kind of step one. Then, you know, having a strong analytic background and being able to work with the data. So usually the people that come into this from internal already know how to do reporting, already know like what are the key metrics of my company and how do I work with them? And then jump straight off of that and then, you know, explore different possibilities. And then you are kind of doing RevOps from inside of your role already. Yeah. Okay. That's a really good takeaway. I think, you know, you're in a specific role and you can already learn the traits and dive deeper in, into them. I mean, do you, do you think that, um, you know, people should, you know, do studies outside, you know, of their jobs, right? Like, are there good resources where you could grow and learn uh, those kind of things? Yeah, absolutely. There's plenty of resources out there. I think even outreach dot like I, I believe is the one, you know, outreach has a whole library of RevOps. You guys also have a great library of different resources available. And then I can't emphasize how amazing the certifications from Salesforce and HubSpot are for this. HubSpot's got like 20 different certifications, including revenue operations now. They will give you a baseline to really like say, hey, I'm comfortable with the, you know, 
I can talk the talk. I can do this at the end of the day from like a semantics point of view. And then it's all just now about applying it. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds to me like, uh, you know, you're in the role, you basically understand the user perspective, right? I think that's always very, very valuable. Uh, and then you learn and try to improve already from there. Um, you know, are there specific things um, you know, that would fast track this development for you? I mean, Other than the certifications, I think also just having acumen with data is the most important thing. Being really strong at spreadsheets, not just VLOOKUPs at the end of the day, but, you know, being able to transform data and migrate it and use it. Because most of the time, like, that's really the gap that RevOps is filling. It's a data gap, right? You know, you, you can have all of your processes as they're done day to day. You've got the CRM and RevOps's role is to make sure that those things are as integral as possible. And so within your role, identifying and understanding how what data you have and then what data you should be having is something that you can definitely fast track. Yeah. How how technical do people need to be? I mean, is it is it helpful, right? Especially with regards to data structure, data storage, uh, and then, you know, essentially creating insights and and you know scores. Like how technical do people need to go and what kind of Maybe even, you know, university courses or, you know, practical courses could be, could, could help there. I have my own take on this and it's like, I prefer the Renaissance man, someone that can do a little bit of everything. But if you, you do, you will find, uh, you know, larger rep, rep ops teams with focuses, focus areas, right? So some people will focus on data, um, enable it at the end of the day. And so really you have to fit whatever your team needs <laughs> for better or worse when you're starting out. But if you are going to be a, Uh, you know, a solo IC contributor, you know, the only person doing it, it's best to have, you know, a very broad strokes thing. And like the things to do in college would be, you know, uh, agile project management courses, you know, data analytics courses, and they're not really teaching Salesforce at the end of the day. And so you'd have to supplement that, you know, the certifications. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to check out the RevOps Letter, a newsletter where Yanis and I share insights from the best revenue operators in the world. It's packed with actionable tips, insightful reports, and strategic advice. And if you have questions, just hit reply and we'll answer them personally. That's what over 1,000 operators love about it already. Go to getweflow.com slash RevOps Letter or just go to the show notes and subscribe now. Do you think there's something like a ceiling uh, for the RevOps career? Like, you know, where do you go? Like when you're like VP of RevOps, can you, like, do you think it's, it's something that's likely to happen at some point that actually revenue operations people could also move into the CRO role? I think from my point of view, it kind of makes sense, right? If you look at the CRO as the person who manages sort of like the whole revenue organization that marketing could theoretically belong to, you don't need the CMO anymore in the future. Or, or do you think that's that's unlikely? That's like a different skill set. It is such a good question, actually. And the answer I give is yes. I, like kind of obviously you've got somebody with, you know, the ability to understand data and processes and sales. And then as long as the product isn't like so complicated that you need that, you know, um, intimate knowledge of how to sell it, you can manage a team of sellers in doing it, right? I wouldn't recommend like a RevOps person go be the CRO of like an enterprise sales org. But, you know, anything that's targeting SMB or mid-market, anything with like a broad strokes, like, you know, horizontal play will have like a much, a, a very easy and also be a very good candidate for those roles. Because what I look for, I mean, now we're going into my ideal CRO, but I look, I look for, you know, a person that's very analytic, very strategic, and can also talk, like coach the sellers into how to be better and also coaches managers and how to be better. And I don't see why revenue operations isn't a, a, a very, you know, It's actually, it should be like a straight stream almost from, you know, ideally you start up in sales, right? SDR, then RevOps, then CRO or something. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, th I think this is it's such a debate, right? I think the CRO over the CMO, right? Like how much marketing do you know as a CRO? And should that be, you know, you know roll into one person or to be two different people, right? I, I think even that is a big discussion. Then, you know, what makes a great CRO Also, depending on your go-to-market motion, mid-market, you know, enterprise, SME. So, yeah, I think we could probably spend another, you know, two hours just talking about that. But I'm curious, you said something that I found really interesting. Um, you know, as a VP, right, to go to CRO, but we, in the entry-level uh, uh, role, 
spoke a lot about kind of administrative, you know, day-to-day -day tactical task, right? Like how do you grow from that to being more strategic over time? Like what are things that would help somebody to develop in their RefOps career over time? That's a good question too. Um, and something that I also addressed in the course of my career, basically, like, I like to think of it as when you start your career, you're like very much in the weeds, right? Like people are just throwing stuff at you and there's these different tasks and you don't have that bird's eye view. You're not like, you know, in the cloud looking down, you don't have that strategy. And so when you're early in your career, giving yourself the time to do that is probably like the first thing to do. Just make sure that you have the time to like ask why, 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 why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Like, does this make sense at the end of the day? Is there a better way to do it? And then start challenging the people around you. Like a big thing about what I do at the end of the day, being a RevOps consultant, is just challenging my challenge, challenge, challenge. Like if it doesn't make sense to me, it probably won't make sense to them when I play it back for them at the end of the day. And so you can do that at any part of your career, right? Like you don't need to wait until you're set up in it. If you see something that doesn't make sense, like raise your hand and say, hey, like this, this needs to change. And then they'll probably be like, you're right, go fix it. And then, you know, you can create that feedback loop, right? Between, you know, actually like analysis, like production, education, and then analysis. So making it making it kind of like a recycling loop between all of the different, you know, things that you're doing. Yeah, I really like your point on, you know, taking the time to work on, you know, day-to-day -day operational tasks, because I think, yes, there's a big debate about being more strategic. And I'd fully get that if you're on the director or VP track, it absolutely needs to happen. But at the same time, you know, the day-to-day -day also creates a better system. I'm a big fan of, you know, iterative improvements. I think they have a big impact and building a scalable revenue organization is like a very complicated house, right? And the small things, they have a big impact. So I think being able to learn them, you know, and spending time with them and then while you do that, learn, you know, yeah, I think you, you put it, put it perfectly, uh, why things are how they are and how they could be better and thinking deeply about that. Um, but yeah, taking the time to really be operational. I think that's a, that's really good for people coming into the job market. You know? I can even jump off that very quickly and just say that that's also why like I'm such an advocate of agile project management in RevOps. Like it is about that iterative process, right? You do it once, you take a couple of weeks, you look at it, you fix it again. <laughs> it's not all, it's not like a like this this whole career is not about doing one and done at the end of the day. It's about like iterating and development and iterate. I mean, I think that like you say like you know, control the things you can control. And I think uh, obviously, you know, you can try and and and, you know, also have that sort of like bird's eye view and, you know, give input in the organization. But obviously it also heavily depends, you know, on the industry, the market dynamics um, and and just like the company you work in and the culture. Like, do you think there's an ideal size of company sort of like that helps fast track your career trajectory? Great question. I mean, so there's kind of, there's starting out, let's, let's focus, we'll say starting out, right? It's not going to be like for you know, somebody with a bunch of years of experience in RevOps, starting out, I would say like 50 to 100 is a good size of like company size. And then the general rule that I've applied in my, my work is like if you, for every eight salesperson people, there should be one revenue operations people. And so for instance, if you're at a, a, at a company of 50, there's probably eight, eight salespeople at the end of the day. And so there's going to be one person. So at that, in that situation, you have to have the trust of, you know, the sales leader, the trust of like, you know, the leadership team that you can do it as an IC starting out probably won't be the case. So like that sweet spot would be probably 75 to like 200 and 500 and above, like really the, you know, those mid-market companies that have sales teams of 20 or more, you will be part of a team. You won't be the only one and you'll learn a lot from the people around. How important is growth of the company? I mean, it's always ideal to have rev <laughs> work work at revenue generating companies. I, I got very blessed working at it just because we were always profitable. And that, that was just like great because you have different problems at the end of the day, right? Every company has a different problem. I mean, that's also something that's applied for my consulting practice. You know, if you're a PLG company versus a sales driven company, if you, um, you know, have no inbound and only outbound, if you, uh, you know, have a very complicated product to sell, like it's an enterprise product versus an SMB focused product, these will all shape the revenue operations work that you're doing. Um, 
And so the sweet spot, if you were going to ask me that would be, you know, if you want to learn the most, like go for an SMB with a good mix of inbound and outbound <laughs> at the end of it. Yeah. And then from an employer perspective, and how do you, how do you make sure that like you hire the right people? Like, is there like a certain, you know, set of like tests or like a certain hiring process do you recommend? Yeah, curious. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of like the the bullets for what I look for in candidates to be successful is that they're driven. Like usually sometimes I'll see people that just don't have drive and that's always like a big problem, especially since it's about iterating fast. Um, the next thing that I look for is a, a fast understanding of the status quo. Usually people are inheriting processes at the moment. And if you don't understand what's going on to begin with, you're gonna you're gonna fall behind really quickly. The third thing would be analytics. So you have a good analytic acumen and you can read and understand data um, very well. And then going back to agile, project management skills at the end of the day, of course, are super duper important. Um, and then, of course, an understanding of the technology and the key challenges that that technology is trying to answer. So an understanding of the product <laughs> uh, that you're kind of trying to support. If there was like an ideal case study to go after that, there's many different ways to do it. You can ask them to define a process within your organization. So, you know, hey, here's here's a rough customer journey. Tell me what actually is going to happen here. Um, you can have them do a Google Sheets or Excel test. I like to do that where I ask, you know, for expansion, contraction, and churn if your uh, B2B SaaS company and ask them to work through, you know, like month over month, what's the growth? What's the, what's, what's the actual trajectory of the business? Um, and then for Salesforce companies, I always ask for a Salesforce acumen part of it. Either have me build me a flow in a sandbox or write a validation rule or create a formula field so that I can see that you can be in the weeds. Do, the, do you do all of them with uh, credit candidates? Sometimes. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, depends, <laughs> depends. Um, I mean, usually the Salesforce part would only be like one or two uh, equations. And then the SaaS part, if you're the, the Excel part, if you're really good, I've seen people do it in two hours. If you're really bad, it'll take you 12. <laughs> um, and then the process definition piece of it. That's like a newer part of it. I used to not ask that, but I think that it's important to see how people think through processes. I used to not care so much about that. And I only focus on the analytics and technical pieces of it. But as RevOps has changed and as it's kind of expanded in what people do, it's important to see that now. I mean, it's such a challenging role, right? It's so broad. It has so many different facets to it. And I think that's why in larger organizations, you see teams being becoming more specialized. But I think it's always great if you actually have experiences across the board and not just in one area, right? I think as a graduate, it's really, really helpful if you come to an, into a situation where, where essentially you're growing fast, you're working with really strong people. So finding people who can teach you something, but then also you have the ability to do a lot and take a lot of responsibility early on. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's always helpful. How do you, I mean, let's, let's assume, you know, you, you run through all these case studies, you know, and people still want to work with you. you know, <laughs> how do you, how do you onboard and measure, you know, uh, success in those roles in the early days, right? Like, I think. I mean, I'll just say that the ones that complete the case study are usually really passionate about working with me. They like are like, oh man, like this guy knows his stuff. Like he's asking me all these really crazy questions. So yeah, so you think? So you think? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, you know if we were to talk about like a thirty, sixty, ninety plan, like there's, it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, at thirty days, I want people to understand the company, right? What is the people process and the flow? Maybe they've gotten their first, first exposure in the CRM and like they're making minor adjustments. Maybe they've done some data analytics. And at 60 days, like it's all focused at the end of the day for me on project management skills. And so at 60 days, you have a project management set up with you and your manager and you're running print um, to basically understand, you know, what am I going to do this week versus next week? And you can handle smaller projects on your own. You don't need to handle all the handholding of someone in there. Uh, and then at 90 days, ideally, you have a great deal of autonomy and you're able to kind of not only do the initiatives that are handed to you, but also you're able to uh, invent and create your own initiatives and pitch your own projects to then do in future. Do you have something like time to ship, right? Like at Fiber or even here at WeFlow, we have something, you know, that new engineers need to ship their first feature and then the first 
week ideally or first two weeks? Like, do you have something like that? If it's like first feature, let's say three weeks, 21 days. Yeah. I think that's acceptable. So I think uh, one thing that's also interesting to look at is, so you, you go through all the assessments, right? You hire that person, you create all those plans. Um, and, you know, that person develops and becomes like a really good RevOps person, maybe at some point takes over their own team. Um, are there some things you, you can, you can tell us or teachers sort of like, how do you, how do you delegate as a RevOps person? Like, how, how do you make sure that when you hire a team, that this team is actually busy and, you know, you can really scale, 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 scale the revenue motion? That's a great question, Philip. Um, essentially, uh, I've been trying to figure this out for many, many years. When I when I started at Adjust, we had to answer this question: like, what do we do? What is what is revenue operation? And I think that what we figured out is that it's a lot. It's like you could even do a rubric, right? Of like, these are all the departments we support. These are all the different things that those departments could need at the uh, you know in order to in order to be the best that they can be. And so um, I developed a rubric kind of to answer that question. To hopefully, you know, enable teams to enable teams to be able to support their companies the most. Um, and so, really, what you can do with this rubric is a couple of things. You can uh, identify, you know, where are the gaps in your own revenue operations department. You can also identify where are the strengths of your teams. So you can say, you know, maybe I have a team member that is focused on marketing, as we talked about earlier. They have this Mar Ops spec. And they essentially, you know, you can you can code that out into this rubric and then say, oh, like this person wants to actually move more into sales. So we can then create, you know, career progression off of this. We can define more about what they want to do in the other departments and then move them into there. You can also see basically if you have it for a whole team, right? You know, you can see, okay, somebody's focused on marketing, somebody's focused on customer success, but maybe there are gaps in sales. Maybe we don't have anybody doing enablement for sales. And these can then generate projects and generate work in terms in, inside of revenue operations teams to then move it forward. So that's the rubric of chaos, <laughs> yeah. which at some link point needs structure. Right? Yeah. 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 But the I link like is it. I in mean, the bio. It, it basically makes sure that um, people in the team then also go through all the different, um, you know, sort of processes and areas of expertise that you need to learn if you want to become really, really good as a ops person and become CRO at some point in your life. And really, there's two different ways that people can approach their careers in revenue operations. You can go for like super broad, you know, you do a little bit of everything and you touch all the different departments and you can jump into any task or topic. That's kind of, I try to look for people like that because it's such a malleable and flexible role. But there's also teams that especially like, you know, if we get to the plus 100 people, you know, plus 50 sales people, that they really have to silo revenue operations. And then it's like, okay, like you're rev ops, but you're focused on the market. You're focused on the sales ops part. And that's completely fine. And that's a great way to develop your career too. Um, you just will end up probably being in, you know, different kinds of roles, right? So my, maybe the Mar ops focused person will end up in a marketing, like a leadership role in the future. That's yeah. Yeah. And I think different size of company as well, right? Uh, I mean, if you're focused on, let's say, marketing or attribution, which is a huge topic, I mean, you could go very deep on that. And a lot of people need that. I'm really passionate about that, by the way. Like, <laughs> yeah. Marketing attribution is the best. We, we gotta, we're going to have a Shadis a Saunders, you know, in, in, in the podcast in a few weeks. And I think he is also quite passionate about that as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a big topic. Uh, we could probably speak another few hours about that. At um, least, at least. Um, but uh, look, I mean, I think this was super insightful. Thanks for sharing all this. I mean, maybe last question for you. I mean, if you were to start, you know, if you dial back 12 years, uh, having learned everything you learned so far, I mean, what would you do different? You know, what what were some of the biggest learnings you've had? I really love that question. Um, I wouldn't have moved to Berlin without knowing German uh, right out of school. That would be the first like advice I'd give myself is that it's very hard. It was very hard to launch a career in English in Berlin at the time. But, but the weather's say, great. The weather's great. Oh my <laughs> goodness. The weather here, especially in the winter, you know, come for the winters. Um, yeah. The, the, advice, the advice I'd give myself is to, um, well, RevOps also, to be fair, wasn't a very, you know, big and important thing in 2012 when I first showed up here. 
And so starting off with those more conventional um, junior level roles, right? Like you can, if you, if this is a career that you're really passionate about, start as a, a, an SDR, start as a BDR, start in something that is a more conventional sales entry level role, and then like work your way into it. And that's, that's what I ended up doing, right? I ended up being an SDR in New York City after, you know, Berlin fell apart for me. And through that, you know, I became the exception. You're really good at forecasting and figuring out how to, you know, move the data around. And then that just led from one thing to another. And then you're you're in a career. <laughs> so just start off small, start off reasonable. Don't, you know, don't pursue things that you just don't have the experience for and go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Cool. Thank you so much. Super. It was great talking to you. Thanks for sharing all your learnings. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you. Thank you.